Hello, welcome. Hi, everyone. Hi, my name is Crystal Nearman, and I'm with the Dog Psychology and Training Center. My daughter, Alaska, will be joining me in just a second. She offered to tuck the kids in uh, to bed tonight, so go for it. Uh, so we did our Facebook Live last week, and at the end of our live, we had um, a couple questions come up. Um, my dog is super clingy. My dog is hyper. And now all of a sudden, my dog cries when we leave. Um, and so cries nonstop when they leave the house. So um, I'm going to go over a couple tips for each of those three things to try and try to resolve some of those behaviors. But I want to start by saying a lot of times when we see symptoms like crying, hyperactivity, clinginess, these are symptoms. They're not the root cause. It's kind of like if you had um, the flu and you went to the doctor and they just handed you a box of, of tissues instead of offering to give you a Tamiflu um, injection to help fight the flu. Um, you know, the box of tissues, it's going to help, you know, your, your face look nice, but it's not going to make the virus go away. Um, and so that's what we want to do. We want to help solve the root cause of the problem and that the symptoms will start to dissolve on their own. So some of these things are going to be directly um, targeting these behaviors. Some of these things aren't going to be directly targeting them, but I assure you they are indirectly targeting these bad behaviors so that you can start to create a solid relationship with your dog. And so that's kind of our thing. It doesn't matter how smart your dog is. If they don't have a relationship with you, if they don't have manners, then nobody really likes them. Um, and so the relationship that I always talk about with our families is simply this. A well-trained dog is not a dog who knows sit down and come. A well-trained dog is a dog who looks to you first. Um, and so what I mean by that is a typical dog, even if they've had obedience training, will still think for themselves, hmm, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do this about that. A well-trained dog is going to see those same things that the untrained dog looks at or hears or smells, but they're going to look to you, the owner, and say, hey, what do you want me to do about that? Um, and that gives you the opportunity to say, nothing. I want you to just chill or, yeah, go ahead and do your thing. So that's what we're going to be talking about, trying to build that relationship so that these symptoms start to dissipate. Um, so hyperactivity. There is, and and I, I will remind everyone, it was a, I believe, a two-year-old female Weimaraner. So Weimaraners um, are from the Pointer family. They're, they're a high-energy dog. They have, very, they have a lot of drive. Uh, meaning anything that moves, they want to point, um, especially flying birds. But for hyperactivity, a lot of dogs, just like kids, won't stop unless they're made to. What I mean by that is toddlers won't just willingly say, hey, you know what, I'm going to stop playing right now and just take a little breather. I'll get back to playing in a few minutes. No, they'll just keep playing until they pass out. Dogs are very much the same way. They will keep playing, they will keep pacing, they will keep doing whatever they do because they don't know how beneficial it is to take a break, to take a breather, and to settle down. Um, so one of the exercises you might have hear, heard us talk about before on our Facebook Lives is called Settle the Dog. And we love this exercise because, one, it's easy. I love lazy dog training. Um, and, two, it's so impactful for the dog. Um, so what is Settle the Dog? Settle the Dog is a dog training exercise that we do that promotes a dog settling on their own. So we're not hovering over them saying, lay down, chill out, don't move, relax. We're, we're helping them want that. We're helping them learn that they can choose that on their own. So what do you do? So we take a leash. It's a six-foot leash preferably, not a retractable leash, um, you know, not a really long training line, but just a, a six foot leash because you don't want the dog to have too much freedom in this exercise where they can be too far away from you and start getting distracted by other things. You want them to kind of be locked into this position um, or in this re this uh, relationship to your position uh, with the leash. So you're going to sit on the leash. If your dog is really big and they can pull the leash from under you, just hold it in your hand. But it's super important that you do three things. You don't look at the dog, you don't talk to the dog, and you do not touch the dog. What if my dog jumps on me? We get that one a lot. Um, and your dog probably will try it because you're ignoring them and they're going to say, hey, did you not see me? I want your attention. Um, if your dog does that, resist every urge to push them off with your hands. What you can do is just take your arm and you can just swipe across to, to help push them down without using your hands. You're just using your shoulder and your arm and you're shrugging them off. And you're going to keep doing it until they give up trying. 
Um, the important thing is to stay calm. Try not to talk to them. Try not to make a big fuss about it. Just stay calm and keep shrugging them off until they stay off. Um, if they start, you know, chewing on things, if it's a puppy, obviously you can um, redirect and take those objects away. Make sure the puppy doesn't have anything in their vicinity that they can chew on. But you just want to help. Uh, you, I'm sorry, blah blah blah. You just want to help remove all those distractions. Um, so sitting on the leash, waiting for the dog. With the, what is the goal? What is the the outcome we're looking for? A dog that is laying down at your feet, um, relaxed. Like basically, they say, "Well, everything else I can't do, so I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna chill." That's what we're looking for. Hey, great! The first time your dog does that, uh, within 30 seconds or a minute, go ahead and let them get up. Say, "Oh, what a good boy! Come on, let's go!" And then just literally like walk away with them. Um, the second time your dog does it, try to push for that like five minute mark of letting them lay for a few minutes. If they get up at minute three or four, again, just keep ignoring them and hopefully they'll settle much faster than they did the first time. So the first time you try, oh, I get all, I get all out of order. So you're going to keep building up this length, this longevity of a down or a lay command. Um, it's not really a command. It's just an outcome. But you want to have it go longer and longer, period, so that your dog can be laying at your feet for 20 minutes and totally okay with it. So the more you practice this exercise, though, the more you're, the quicker your dog is going to settle on their own. So the first time you try this, it might take 20 minutes. It might take 30 minutes. It, take, it might take 45 minutes before your dog actually lays down, especially for those dogs that are really wound up and really hyper and very anxious um, because those dogs don't know how to show off. And so they'll, they'll might, they might be pacing. Um, they might be sitting, standing, sitting, standing. Um, they might lay down for a half second and stand back up like, I can't, I can't relax. I got to be on alert. Those dogs might take a little bit longer before they actually truly settle but the more you practice this exercise, the faster it gets each time until after, you know, five, six reps of doing this, your dog is boom down at your feet laying as soon as you sit down, like, yep, this is, we're just not going to do anything right now. Um, that's what we're looking for. That is a dog that to me knows that it can shut off its mind and relax all by itself without an owner having to prompt them. So yes, we're kind of controlling the situation to make them relax, but they're still making the choice to relax on their own. So we're not forcing them to. Does that make sense? Um, if not, post in the question or the comments, post your questions, and I will try to address them before the end of the video. The other thing um, that we do for, um, for hyper dogs is the enough command. And the enough command is something that we use my goodness, a ton with our kids, with our dogs. Um, what it means is what you're doing isn't wrong. That's enough of it. Um, so excessive barking, excessive playing. Um, if your dog might be licking itself, dogs, just like kids, don't know to stop scratching an itch. They just think it feels so good. So I'm going to keep scratching and licking it until it's an open sore. Um, so we use the enough command for that. Hey, scratching yourself is fine. But as soon as we say enough, that's enough. You just don't want to push it farther than it needs to be. Um, and then the other um, barking and playing. So if somebody's at our house and our dogs bark, we'll praise them. Hey, thanks for letting me know someone's here. That's enough. I got it from here. Um, if your dog does excessive playing or playing too rough or playing at inappropriate times, like maybe after the kid's bedtime or when you have friends over and you're trying to have a conversation and your dogs are barking and playing and growling in, in the room and it's just too loud, that's when we'd use the enough command. Um, and so how, we, how do we teach the enough command? There's a couple different ways. So for the excessive playing, um, I would start with this one because it really is, for us, the easiest one to start with. Um, and get your dog riled up, start playing with them, whether it's you playing with them, whether it's them playing with another dog, and you're going to give the enough command. They're, of course, not going to listen because it's probably the first time they've heard this word, or they've heard it a lot and just never listened before. So you're going to say enough. They don't listen. You're going to say no, enough. And you're going to grab their leash, and you're going to pull them apart from whoever they're playing with, and if it's yourself, you just stop all play. So you don't engage anymore until they calm down. So you're going to grab the leash, pull them away, and hold them away from their pal for a few minutes, um, letting them settle. And literally, you know, the, the, the heart is beating so fast because they're playing, they're having fun. When you pull them away and you prevent that play from continuing, the heartbeat will slow to a calmer beat. And then you can let them go. They may choose to go back and play as long as they're playing gently and calmly. That's fine. Or they may choose to go lay down. That's fine too. Um, and you can decide what your enough outcome is for play. For us, I have two enoughs. The first one means what you guys are just getting out of control. So too loud, 
uh, too much running. It sounds like a stampede. Come on. I told them you were coming. Yes, we started, but they're waiting on you. So uh, what was I saying? Oh, so two and F's. The first enough means stop barking, um, stop rough housing or whatever they're doing. The second time I have to say enough to my dogs means they couldn't handle the first enough I gave them. And so they're done playing. So it's almost like you guys are done. Go lay down. No more playing. That's it. Um, so Alaska, this is your last chance. I'm going to invite you over to the Facebook live. I got to keep talking. So come on. Okay. Um, and then barking. So barking is a little bit harder unless you've taught the dog to speak on command because then you can teach them the enough command very quickly because you can teach them to bark and then tell them enough um, and then praise them for that. But if your dog is just barking because there's people here or whatever, you might have to teach another command to help them focus that attention on instead of barking. Um, so for us, it would be sit or place and that easily distracts them from their barking. We can praise them for that little bit of quiet they give us. And then we start to prolong that bits of, of quiet and then praising them. Um, so they know that once we say enough, that's it. No more. Uh, so, and that's the enough command. Um, and that works really well for those dogs that are hyperactive because they don't know how to stop. So we're going to help them stop with the settle the dog exercise and the enough command. Um, for super clingy dogs, before I get to that, I would like to pause and reintroduce ourselves. So for those of you that might just be joining in, my name is Crystal. Can get on your knees? Do you want to get on your knees so they can see you? Um, we are, we are live, so you've got to have a good attitude, okay? Okay. Uh, say hi, Alaska. Hi, <laughs> And where are we from? What business are we talking about? And you got to say it really loud or they won't be able to hear you. Dog Psychology and Training Center. And what are we doing today? What are we going to be talking about? Anxious dogs, hyper dogs, clingy dogs. You gotta, you gotta get up so they can see you. You gotta grow a little bit taller. Can you get on your knees like you did last time? Okay, there you go. But there this she is, is. This is too you high. You can get down a little bit. Okay, sorry guys. Sorry to stop in the middle. Um, remember, you lean towards me, and I lean towards you. Okay, I'm so sorry. Um, where were we? Clingy dogs. We deal with clingy dogs a lot. And um, one of, it's one of my biggest pet peeves, honestly. Um, dogs that are clingy mean they don't have any confidence, which means they're usually really stressed and they just don't feel comfortable in their own skin. And it's a pet peeve of mine because those dogs have heart, excuse me, higher cortisol levels, more stress in their lives, and they typically live a, a shorter life because that's what stress hormone cortisol does. It decreases your lifespan. So um, <laughs> try to get up. They can't see um, so for clingy dogs, you got to start building their confidence. Um, there's a few exercises we do that you can try at home to help build your dog's confidence. Some of them are really silly and I've never tried to Google it, but you could probably try Googling, um, um, online dog obstacle or not online dog obstacle course to see if you can help, uh, find some ideas. But one of the ones we do is what is a empty water or empty kitty pool and we put empty water bottles in it and it sounds super silly but those water bottles are really loud in that pool and we'll, we'll actually sprinkle the dog's food in that kitty pool and they have to dive in and eat their food that way um so it's really fun once they get the hang of the game or for dogs that are very confident already they love this and they will just dive right in um to get those those food that food but for dogs that are very fearful or clingy and they may not jump right in right away. So what we do is we push some of the water bottles over so that half of the pool or a fourth of the pool is ex just pool bottom. You can see straight down to the pool bottom. There's no water bottles there. And we'll put their food there, all of their food, all of their dinner. This is the only way they eat. Um, so they might skip a meal or two at first, but believe me, they're going to get hungry and they're going to say, oh, I really want to get this kibble. And the beauty is when they get that kibble, they will literally like, so here's the bottom of the pool. They will get it and then they'll like run away like, oh, I did it. But then what happened? 
success. They didn't die. Nothing bad happened. And so they're going to quietly creep back and maybe get a couple more kibbles and then run away. And they're going to start getting more and more confident each time because they are winning every time they are conquering this fear battle until before you know it, they are diving in the kiddie pool and moving all the water bottles around, swimming in the water bottles to get all their food. So that's one exercise we do to build confidence. Um, another exercise we do to help a dog not be so clingy is the place exercise. Um, so we have place is basically, um, um, hold on, going back to the kiddie pool, a kid pool. Uh, so like a, a pool you can buy at Walmart in the, the summer section. It's like um, a, it's like a, Pool that's like round but not too deep. Right. So it's probably what six, seven inches deep. Mm -hmm. Um, and so you can get them at most stores for like ten bucks. And then if you drink bottled water, um, take your little empty water bottles, little plastic water bottles, and put them in the kiddie pool um, after they're empty. And you can remove the labels so your dog doesn't eat them and get sick. It's um, just called a kiddie pool. Kitty pool because it's small, so kitties, if they don't know how to swim, they'll sink, and that's not too far away, so people can pick them up and get them out. Yes. Can you sit on your knees? Because I feel like they can't see you very well. Um, and then what was the next? Oh, so clingy dogs. And we are going to talk about um, when they cry when you leave when they, when they you leave the house, too. So um, clingy dogs. We're going to talk about them first. So the kitty pool helps build their confidence. And then sit back so they, they can see me <laughs> and you. Um, and this hurts when I'm bending down and up. We'll scoot forward a little bit. <laughs> um, my goodness, you are distracting me so much today. Um, what was I talking about? I'm so sorry, everybody. Mom brain is real. Okay, place command. So place is, we teach it on a cot because the cot is a raised dog bed. So it's about two and a half, three inches off the ground. And it's a clear way to define a dog's boundary. So if my phone was a place cot, um, and I, you know, can see it's, it's elevated, right? So it's above the ground. And then this on the top would be the boundary. And place means you have to stay on this object and you can't step off. And so tell that person says you can. Exactly. Until they have permission. So this allows you to get away from clingy dogs. Um, I wouldn't leave the room yet when you put them in place for the first time, but put them on place, stay place, invite them up there. Um, you can throw some kibble or whatnot on top so the dog can um, to eat it off and feel comfortable and like the place. Uh, but once they get on it, anytime they try to stay, step off, you're going to use the leash. Always have the leash on when you're training your dog. You're going to use the leash to guide them back to the place cat and say, no place, every time they try to step off. The faster you or are. Or maybe if you have the collar clip. Right, or if you have the e-collar, which and usually you're working with a professional trainer and they can show you how to use that. But if you don't have the e-collar, um, you're going to use the leash. So as soon as that foot comes off, you're going to say, no, place. And you're going to guide them back onto the place. And like I was saying, the faster you say no place, as soon as they step off, the, the faster you curb that naughty behavior. If you wait till their whole body's off of the place command and then you say no place, it's, it's way harder to get them back on because now they, they're free. They're, they're off. Um, so try to keep them on the place. Start shorter durations and work your way up to longer durations. Um, once your dog's doing it for a minute, tell them break. That's our free word, and they're free to get off. And then next time, have them go up. Um, do that for a couple days. Maybe then go to five minutes for a couple days, 15 minutes for a couple days. Our training homework is 20 minutes on a place straight. So if they get off on minute 18, just pause the clock, put them back on. As soon as all four pause or on the place cut again, add two more minutes. Um, so they can do 20 minutes. So that's the place command. So once you teach the boundary and the duration to place, then you're going to start getting away from your dog. So don't leave the other room, okay, because you got to watch them in case they get off. But have them placed maybe in front of the TV. So if they um, try to break the command, your eyes are already focused in that direction of the room, and you can see them and say, no place, and get them back on there. But you're going to have them placed. I always tell people in front of the TV. And then you're going to sit back away from them on the couch preferably four to five feet away from them. But you're going to have their leash kind of laying pointed towards your direction. So you're not, you don't have to touch the leash, but I want it to kind of be pointing in your direction. So if your dog tries to bolt off of the place, you can quickly step on that leash before they get too far and then guide them back to the place. So um, let me know if you have any questions with the place. And um, so we did um, confidence building exercise. 
place another command that I love because I am not a physical touch type of person. I don't like people touching me. I don't like clingy kids and I don't like clingy dogs. They drive me insane. Uh, not that I don't like dogs to cuddle with me. There's a difference. Uh, but clinginess, I'm just like, whoa, get away. Uh, so what we teach dogs is part of our livability or house manners. Um, and that's get back, get back. Um, or go lay down. Whatever commands, the first thing that comes out of your mouth, that's what you want to say. But you can teach dogs to go away, just like you can teach kids to go away. So if I have a dog that's staring at my face, like, right, here's my dog face. If I have a dog just staring at my face and I'm trying to work or, or read or something or maybe, um, you know, spend time with my kids and they're just right here staring at me, um, I'll tell them to go lay down. If they go lay down, that's great. If they go play, that's great too. For me, go lay down means get out of my face. <laughs> Give me some space. Um, and so if they try to lay at my feet, not okay. Because I said go lay down, not lay down. I said go lay down. There's a difference. Um, and so they can start to pick up on that. Or you can say back or you can say get back. Whatever that is, be consistent with it and teach them to go away. So how do you teach them? Use the leash. We always have the leash on in training. Here's um, the difference of lay down and go lay down yeah, tell because us. laying down just means they can just lay down yeah. anywhere they want but go lay down means they have to go far away because the farther they get the less you know they're looking at you it's true and when they're not looking at you and when they're not close to you they realize they're surviving without you clingy dogs are close because they feel like they need you to survive they don't they can be in the other room and they'll survive just fine like our baby cat who now can go outside. Yes, Ghost has graduated to an and indoor, she, outdoor and cat. And she usually needed us with her because she was just too good, but now she's allowed to go outside. Yep. So she doesn't need us anymore. Yep. You got it. Um, so those are the exercises um, that we teach for clingy dogs. Exercise, or not exercise, um, confidence building with the kiddie pool with the empty water bottles teaching the place command and teaching a uh, go back or uh, go lay down, get back, back command. Um, and you can use this command, the, the go lay down, get back, whatever you want to call it command uh, for dogs that are clingy to you, but also for dogs that are clingy to your guests, because you know, your dogs will find that one person who petted them and they'll be like, keep petting me, keep petting me, keep petting me. And they'll follow them around. So you can just tell them, go lay down, leave my friend alone, keep go lay down. That's right, that's how they are. Um, and then the last thing we wanted to talk about today, um, we're getting kind of long on time, so I'm gonna wrap it up. But the last thing was um, the dog cries nonstop when we leave the house. Um, so again, it's going back to that, that lack of confidence. Um, a dog that willingly will go in its crate when you tell them to um, is a dog that trusts you. It's like, okay, you think it's time to go in the crate? I'm gonna go. Um, a dog that fights you or cries when you leave is a dog that's saying, no, no, I didn't, one, I didn't give you permission to leave, or two, I can't survive without you and I'm going to die. Please come back. Both of those are irrational. Um, a dog needs to be able to relax and be calm when you're gone because that's healthy. It's important for them to have that quiet time. So um, if your dog's crying nonstop when you leave the house, depending on the severity of the separation anxiety, um, it might be something that you need to seek the help of a professional, whether it's us or somebody else, it does not matter. But um, you, because separation anxiety is more than just crying when you leave the house. There's a lot of mental triggers that are involved with that, that a professional trainer might need to get involved so that we can address those mental triggers and help the dog be calm when you're not home. But some things that you can try if it's not severe separation anxiety, create the dog. Sometimes when dogs are left free in the house, it's overwhelming for them. They have way too much freedom. They don't know what to do. They don't think they're going to survive. They get bored. Maybe they get destructive. Or maybe they scream. My miniature schnauzer was like this. Pepper, um, you don't know this, but when Pepper was, when we first got him, so he's probably between five months and a year, um, if we put him in his crate and leave, he was fine. But one time I thought, when he was probably about eight or nine months, uh, maybe a year, I thought, I'm going to see how he does out of his crate, just testing those waters, you know, from puppyhood to adulthood, um, as I go down to the mailbox and come back. So I was gone, oh my goodness, three minutes. Um, as soon as I left the house, 
Pepper started screaming like he was dying. And I'm like, okay, we'll see how long this goes. I'm just going to walk to the mailbox. It's only a couple minutes away. I walked away. I could hear him the whole time because the mailbox was close to our house. And as I come back, he's still screaming. So I thought, this is ridiculous. He's never done this before. So I put him in his crate and I did the same thing. I went outside, walked to the mailbox, came back. He didn't make a peep. So then I let him out again, walked to the mailbox. He started screaming as soon as I left and screamed until I got back. Some dogs just can't be left out um, because it's too much freedom freedom for them. Pepper felt safe in his crate. Out of the house, he felt exposed and not cool. Um, so go back to crate training basics, um, teaching your dog to like your crate, making the crate a available um, option for your dog throughout the day. Even when the door is wide open, encourage them to go lay in it, put, put treats in there, put their favorite toys in there, um, and crate them when you're gone. If they are screaming and barking in their crate, um, there are a couple different things you can try. Some of the things that you can just buy and try out are bark collars. Um, so they have vibration ones, which are hit or miss. You know, um, some dogs don't mind the vibration. Uh, some dogs, the vibration is too much and it's terrifying to them. And that's not fair to the dogs. We don't want them to be terrified um, for barking. We just want them to know, hey, that behavior is not allowed. Please stop. And then, um, so the vibrate, it's hit or miss. And then for some dogs, it works good though. Um, the citronella, same effects, kind of like Goldilocks and the three, ba three bears. Uh, too little, too much, or just right. Um, some dogs, the citronella bark collars work really well. Um, I would honestly say that most dogs that we've encountered, the citronella did not work, the vibrate did not work, but the one that has sometimes worked is a, a static stimulation bark collar. So a static correction um, gives them a little tingling sensation um, that can be... A good one will have multiple settings. You can start on a low setting and find that level that makes your dog say, eh, I didn't like that. I don't want to do it again. So it's almost like anytime your dog barks, we want this to um, correct them. It's almost like um, when a baby is reaching for a hot stove, um, I'm absolutely going to smack their bottom. And I would rather them cry from me smacking their bottom. Not going to be hard, but enough to make them be like, ooh, I did not like that experience between me and my mom when I reached for that hot stove. So the next time they come in the kitchen and the hot stove is on, they're not going to go near it. They're not going to reach for it. And they might even look at mom or dad to say, hey, is it safe? Um, because that is, that to me, I'd rather my kid have a little swat for me on their bottom than have a permanent scar in their hand for touching to Right, for touching a hot object. Um, the same is true for going out towards the road. My kids need to stop and look both ways or ask permission before they cross the street. And if they just walk out, I would rather me give them that, that swat to their bottom or a timeout or whatever consequence it's going to be that makes them regret not thinking through the responsibility of crossing the street. So with a bark collar, it kind of does the same thing with the static stimulation or the static correction. Every time your dog barks, they're going to get a static correction. If your dog barks louder, it's going to get a static correction. And some of the units will even have an escalating feature. So it'll start low. If your dog keeps barking, it gets a little bit higher. If your dog keeps barking, it gets higher and higher and higher until your dog stops and then it stops. Um, and so a bark collar can sometimes be a great asset. For some dogs, it might be really traumatic um, and is not a good thing to use. So you just got to be open to trial and error and understanding and reading your dog's body language to know, is this tool working? Is it getting through to my dog? Is it hindering um, because it's making my dog fearful and that's not what we want? Or is my dog blatantly ignoring the static correction, which has happened, um, and it's not working? In which case, if those uh, if those don't tr if those putting your dog in the crate and trying a bark collar doesn't work, then you might need to, to seek the help of a professional trainer to um, help work on your dog's mind, um, because we want to start creating positive habits and positive associations with crate time and freedom, um, so that they can be calm and relaxed when you leave the house. Um, so. Those are, our, those are our responses for the question we had last week about um, the, the two-year-old wine that was super hyper, super clangy, and would cry nonstop when the owners would leave the house. So I hope they answered their questions. Um, if you guys have questions, please post them down in the comments below. We, excuse me. We'd love to chat about it next week. Um, hopefully, Alaska will be here at the beginning 
of the Facebook Live. Uh, but thank you for joining us late, and thank you for putting your brother and sister to bed. Uh, did you have anything to add? Um, for, for the next one, we can, we, we can talk about how um, dogs get, like, how we can like we have to teach dogs not to get other animals that can be beside like cats and other animals that they might want to chase away without asking their parents. Yeah, that is a great topic. So talking about impulse control with dogs around other animals, cats, other dogs, squirrels, snakes, birds, and how it's important for them to ask permission for their from their parents before they go do those things, right? We can teach them manners in the manner we say can say yes or no. Yep, you got it. That's a great topic. So if we don't get any... And they do not. And also that they do not kill them. Right. Super important. Super important. So um, <coughs> our, some animals we need for our lives, too. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's so true. And they can kill them. Okay. Because, <laughs> like... Um, bees and stuff like that, they might chase, and that's sad because we eat honey from them. That's right. We need the bees to pollinate our flowers and our trees and to make us delicious honey. All right, guys, we're going to wrap it up. Um, we hope to see you guys next Thursday at 730 for our Facebook Live. And if you have questions, please put them down in the comments, and we would love to talk about it next week. Bye, everyone. Bye. See you later. Do you know how to say bye in Spanish? Um, adios. Adios, amigo. Adios, amigo.